Welcome back to the discussion of spatial data mining. Uh, in previous videos, we talked about the definition of spatial data mining, what it is, what it is not. We gave examples of common pattern families. Uh, we briefly revisited the spatial statistical foundations and talked about notions like autocorrelation and heterogeneity. And then since then, we have been looking at different pattern families in detail. We looked at location prediction models and how they are different than the classical prediction models. We also looked at uh, hotspot detection techniques and how they are different than classical clustering methods like k-means. In this video segment, we are going to visit the topic of anomalies or outliers. Okay? So after this module, we are going to, uh, we should all be able to know about spatial outlier detection tests and uh, distinguish those from um, you know, the classical outlier detection test. In addition, we should also notice that conceptually, spatial outliers are very different than global outliers and be able to distinguish the two. Okay? So with this, let's go back and quickly recall the example we had for spatial outliers. So we all remember this traffic data from Twin Cities highways where you know, the y-axis were sensors on one particular freeway, I-35W, 60 sensors, and x-axis was time of the day. And in particular, we were curious about the sensor number nine because its readings were very different from its neighbors. Okay? Even though the individual readings were not anomalous because there is plenty of this teal color in the picture, but it, the, you know, the interesting part was that read, these readings were different from neighbors. Okay? To give you a much more simple example to contrast global outlier and spatial outlier, Let's look at a much simpler space. So here is a one dimensional space, just location. And we are looking at a simple attribute. You know, this attribute may be traffic flow along the highway, or it may be, you know, some other attribute like rainfall along a river length and so on, okay? So in the beginning, it's location zero and so on. The values are low, then it rises, peaks, comes down, then there is a spike here, then, you know, comes down and then it flattens out, okay? So in this picture, if we first want to talk about the notion of global outliers, what the traditional statistics talks about, then it will essentially look at the values. It will essentially watch the values on the attribute value axis, y axis. Okay? And then you know, if you do that, then essentially values which are very high, like the maxima, which are circled here, or very low, like the minima, they will look very different than the population because most of the values are in the center. There are only a couple of values this high or that low and those are called global outliers. Okay? In contrast to that, the spatial outliers are values like this, this spike, where this value is very different than the neighbor. So if you look at the location of S and then the locations nearby, just before or after, the values are very different. Okay? So again, if you know calculus, you can treat it as the derivative notion or discontinuity notion. And those are more interesting in space. And again, you can ask why are these interesting? Okay, so you can relate this back to first law of geography, which basically said that nearby things are very similar. So whenever there is an exception to first law of geography, it is interesting and people want to look at that. For example, in case of this traffic, when this pattern was shown to the Department of Transportation, they felt that the sensor nine was a bad sensor and they replaced it, okay? All right, and the same thing can happen in other domains as well, where discontinuities may flag some uh, strange behavior. So let's try to go and see how people detect it statistically. So, uh, so the simplest tests are based on visualization. So one test is called variogram cloud. So in this case, you know, if you again look at the same data sets, then you know, we can create a visualization of this in two dimension, which is shown on the right. Here x axis and y axis are going to plot pairs of points. So if there are n points in your original data set, in the variogram plot, there are n choose two points, roughly quadratic, okay? For each pair, so if you think about a pair, you know, which takes S and its neighbor P, so P comma S is a pair. For that pair, we compute two things. First, we compute the difference in their attribute value, which is very high, right? This difference is high. And that goes on the y-axis, okay? It's a high difference. The second thing we compute is the difference in their location in space, and that's very low. So that goes on the x-axis. So this x-axis is the distance between the two points. Y-axis is the difference between their attributes. Okay? And then we put all the plot point pairs in this plot. Now, once we have that, uh, 
then uh, we essentially say that points that are close to this uh, x equal to y axis here. In other words, their attribute value difference is proportional to their geographic distance. Those points are considered normal because they are complying with first law of geography. Okay? However, points which are on this left corner where attribute value difference is much higher, you know, it's very, very high, but geographic distance is low, they are flagged as pairs which are anomalous. And those pairs have to be then processed to find the real spatial discontinuity. So in this particular diagram, if you did that, then you know, remember the spatial outlier S. So the pairs involving that show up here in the diagram. And notice they are both in the upper left-hand corner. Okay? So they are the closest to or furthest away from this x equal to y line. So these have to be processed. And once you look at them, you notice that spatial outlier S shows up in multiple pairs. So that would be taken out by manual processing or by eyeballing as the most offending data set. And then you, you have to remove that and reprocess the data to see if the other points like P and Q continue to be offending or not. Okay? So this is one test. It's primarily for uh, human consumption or it's the visualization based test. Uh, there is another test called scatter plot. In this case, we look at the same data set, but uh, you know, the plot that we are creating is slightly different. So here in x axis, we look at attribute value. Okay? So in, in this plot, you know, each point in scatter plot corresponds to an individual point in your original data set. So if original data set has n point, scatter plot also has n point. Okay? However, those points are plotted differently. Okay? So for a given point, let's say S or P, in the scatter plot x axis is it's their attribute value. Okay? And the y axis is average attribute value in the neighborhood. Okay? So we are in some sense comparing attribute value of each point with the attribute value in the neighborhood. You are sort of trying to do a difference or a derivative. Okay? So if we plotted it this way, then you can imagine that wherever you have first law of geography, where the point is similar to its neighbors, then they would lie near x equal to y line. Okay? But if the points are very far from this line, then they are violating first law of geography. So again, in this case, S turns out to be the furthest one from the line. But you know, because of S, it turns out its neighbors P and Q also get flagged because P and Q also are moved away from the line due to S. Okay? So again, in this process, you have to first remove the highest offending point S and recompute the value for its neighbors to see if S were not in the data set, will the neighbors still be offending. Okay? So you have to do again one step at a time. Now, scatter plot has been, uh, you know, refined a little bit to something called Moran's at scatter plot, and where this the x and y axis are refined slightly. Okay, so let's quickly take a look at that. So, in Moran's scatter plot, the x and y axis, instead of being the attribute value or neighborhood average attribute value directly, they are normalized statistically. Okay, so they are the z score. So, if you remember from your statistics, given a random variable x. Its z score essentially is x, you know, you subtract the mean of x and you divide it by standard deviation of x. Okay? And that normalizes the value between 0 and 1. So that's what is done to each axis. So here x axis, instead of plotting attribute value for the point, we are plotting z score of attribute value of the point. Okay? And same thing on the y axis, instead of plotting neighborhood average, we are doing z score of neighborhood average. And again, you look at you know, this x equal to y line, things which are further away are flagged. And in this case, again, s will be flagged. And uh, this method, again, you have to first take out the highest offending point and readjust the neighbor's value before you flag other points. Okay? You can do the same thing more directly. And in this case, we are going to show you a z test, you know, um, where you basically take the say, these end points. And in this case, your x axis can be left as location. So the same location that we had before in x-axis can be used here. And y-axis is essentially the difference between the neighborhood attribute value and the point's own attribute value. So you look at the difference and then you normalize it. And when you do that, then essentially this horizontal line zero is where everything is expected to lie based on first law of geography. Things which are very far away from this zero are considered outliers. So for example, S in this case is about two, three standard deviations away and is the highest offending. Once you take out S and readjust the neighborhood value, then you can look at for the second one. Okay.
So these are many different tests that people have designed to look at spatial outlier. From computing perspective, here is an interesting observation. You know, in, in these cases, you will essentially see two types of computation. One is model building. For example, in case of z-test, we had to go and find the average for the attribute, average for the neighborhood minus the location and so on. And once you have done that, then people do the testing. Then you can go back and revisit each point and compute the value and, and complete the test. Okay? So a, a major insight is the following, that uh, your neighbor, you know, the, the model building phase is based on a, a database operation called self-join. So if you remember spatial querying chapter that we did before, we talked about spatial joins and we also talked about spatial self-join. And it turns out that most of these outlier detection tests in terms of computation behave like spatial self-join. So if you have access to a good SQL OGIS product which implements spatial join well, then you can scale up spatial outlier detection tests to very large data sets. Okay? All right. And essentially one scan of spatial join can give you these results. Okay. Great. So again, spatial outlier detection, you know, there are many tests and they are supported through many software and you can even code them very easily yourself. Uh, but what is happening next? Okay. So one issue with these tests, if you remember that in every case we said, you detect one outlier at a time because a bad apple gives, you know, highest score to its neighbors. So if your data set has many, many spatial outliers, then it takes many iterations to remove them. So one direction of research is looking at ways to detect multiple spatial outliers simultaneously and reduce computational cost. Okay? Uh, the other issue you might have also seen that all the tests were based on a single attribute. Okay? But in many data sets, you have many, many attributes. So people are again looking at ways to define tests with many attributes. Okay? Uh, and in general, you know, we look at scaling up to larger data. People are also looking at other creative ways to define outliers. So again, you might remember from the first video, there was an example of um, you know, farmlands in North Korea, where some were close to transportation, features like roads or rivers, and others were not close. The ones which were not close were flagged as outliers because they violated this common co-locations of farmlands being accessible by transportation. And again, you know, if you're coming from agriculture domain, that will make a lot of sense because you have to move the product out and so on. And things which are not close to transportation may have other nefarious interpretations. Right? Uh, and those are more creative definitions of outliers and people are looking at many of those as well. Okay? So to wrap up this video segment, you know, we essentially wanted to look at the notion of spatial outlier. We first contrasted it with the notion of global outlier. And we saw that in, in many cases, these two give you different patterns. Spatial outliers are violation of the spatial smoothness or first law of geography, whereas global outliers look at things which are extreme values, either maxima or minima. We also looked at several outlier detection tests. Some were visual and manual and others were algorithmic. And finally, we noticed that their computational structure is same as spatial self-join, which we had seen in the querying language. So with this, we'll wrap up uh, this video segment. In the next video segment, we'll look at you know, the fourth pattern family of co-locations, which is related to association rules. So look forward to seeing you there. Uh, thank you.